Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all in the knowledge sharing session on actions for happiness. So before we start, let me introduce you with aims. So, in the annals of management education sector, 27th August 1988 should be remembered as a great landmark as it was on this day. AIMS, Association of Indian Management Schools, a highly impact making networking body, was born. It has the strong support of about 550 high ranking B schools as its members and is one of the largest networking bodies in the world. It is an umbrella organization for the management institutions. And AIMS has been involved in various activities and the it's working for protecting the interest of management institutions from the vagaries of restrictive governmental regulations, professionalization of management education and creation and dissemination of management related knowledge through its various activities like round tables for deans and directors. And it is also involved in faculty and student development events, organizing conventions, national and international level seminars and workshops, publications and distribution of AIM journals of management, funding of research projects and financial assistance. Recently, AIMS has been diversifying into new activities for the benefits of deans, directors, researchers, students, faculty members in the shape of inspiring young leaders and knowledge sharing sessions at least one each every week and these new initiatives are fascinating to many faculty and young minds of students and today we are part of one such knowledge sharing session for faculties uh, moving further let me introduce myself my name is Mohit Sati I am assistant professor in master school of management merit in academics my interest areas are data analytics digital marketing programming languages and since my college days, I was an active volunteer in organizing meditation and well-being workshops and seminars. And since last 11 years, I have been associated with His Holiness Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji in the Art of Living Foundation. And actively volunteering as the Art of Living teacher, I have trained youth, uh, corporate people, I have trained uh, prison inmates, I have trained farmers, and, and has been actively working on the topic of happiness and meditation on the ground. Now, moving further, let me introduce you with the speaker of the day, Dr. Prabhat Pankaj. He is an international researcher on happiness and well-being. Sir is teaching course on happiness to be school students. So, Dr. Prabhat is a Harvard-trained leader in higher education and currently working as the director of Jaipur Institute of Management, Jaipur. And he was an invitee at World Government Summit Dubai in 2019 by the Ministry of Happiness, UAE. In his 30 plus years of teaching career, he has spent seven years in Bhutan and worked closely with Center of Bhutan Studies and Trade Ministries on the subject of happiness, trade, WTO and poverty. Sir has published five books and numerous research papers in reputed journals. And recently, Sir has received the title of National Unicorn of Happiness by the All India Council of Technical Education, AICT for his initiative of teaching credit course on happiness and cultivating a positive education environment through nudges and interventions of Jaipuri Institute of Management. Sir has engaged happiness session for a large number of institutions and organizations, cutting across sections such as students, faculty, corporate managers and top leaders. He has also engaged sessions on effective teaching, teaching leadership, innovative pedagogy, and outcome-based teaching and learning. Sir is running a blog post on learning and happiness named The Learning Corridor. And we are soon going to meet, sir. And before moving further, let me set a stage for the session. Uh, all participants will be on mute. Kindly post all your questions in the Zoom chat or on YouTube chat. If you are on YouTube, you can post on YouTube. If you are on Zoom, you can post on Zoom. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. Attendance link will be shared anytime during the session on the Zoom chat and YouTube chat. Kindly fill that form to get the certificate. You People on YouTube can get the link on YouTube chat and people on Zoom can get the link on Zoom chat. Now moving further about the session, action for happiness. Let me uh, give you a brief outline so that uh, and, and hand over the stage to the sir. 
um, there are many questions scattered around with the word happiness and educating happiness what is the real definition of happiness how can it help in improving students learning abilities students employability can happy student create a vibrant constructive and learning environment in campus how happiness can be taught what are the advantages of learning happiness there are many questions for that and happiness and well-being as you all must be aware is now being taught at leading universities it started at harvard is now taught at yale berkeley and has the reputation of the most popular program in the campus in india isb hyderabad iit kharagpur i am ahmedabad and i am bangalore and introduced such happiness course in online and in person version for students as well as executives and positive education and well being based framework of education is adopted in many countries across the world so if around the world it is being adopted should we also start moving the direction of teaching happiness now let me hand over the session to the right person our speaker of the session dr prabhat pankaj i would request sir to quench our thirst on understanding the concept of happiness and the actions for happiness sir all over to you uh thank you uh, professor mohit and uh, namaskar uh, to all the attendees uh, today uh, who have joined on this very important topic uh, happiness um more than deliberation uh, probably there will be a lot of questions at the back of uh, everybody's mind so i would like to keep more time for question answers so probably i will take about 40 45 minutes to talk about happiness because it's such a vast subject that you know uh, even for two days deliberation uh, all aspects can Not be covered, but I'll unearth a little bit of you know relevant aspects for all the faculty members who have joined today. Uh, from the perspective of the questions that Professor Mohit has actually raised, uh, where does it lead to? How does it affect the students? What are we actually talking about? Uh, how can we implement this in our campus? If suppose we want to do this in our campus, how can we do that? Uh, we already know that uh, AICT affiliated institutions uh, are part of Happiness Drive. uh by the by 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 an organizations called YOL the uh the your one life uh initiated by yogesh kochar uh, he has developed an app is called the YOL app one life app uh and the students are using those app in the campuses so I, we are the beneficiary of that using the app as well uh, so what is that i mean uh, technology coming into happiness uh and the first question that drives our mind is that what happiness is actually i mean that's is the most fundamental questions i mean uh, the the common notion about happiness uh, is that uh, happiness is uh, immeasurable uh, you cannot just uh, see or measure happiness uh, happiness is personal uh, it comes to you uh, if you're happy uh, you're lucky uh, it cannot be designed for happiness cannot be designed for uh, is hard to work for the happiness how can you say that you can work for the happiness uh, so these are some of the some of the questions and one of the factor why such kind of myth uh has been there associated with happiness is uh that you know we have this old good faith uh in the view that uh anything good that happens to us uh, is not to be shared with others so you know a good thing not to be shared it's, it's a big no no uh and happiness is very very personal uh probably in the last 20 years uh, down the line uh, you know you can we can take it to 30 years let's say 20 to 30 years uh when we started looking at at uh, the research that has come from the neuroscience that's number one the behavioral science the mind the science of the mind uh, and richard davidson is one of the pioneers so we have started looking at that and then the clinical psychology uh, probably you know martin seligman and his uh, happiness lab and we started looking at that and then the historical perspective we started talking uh, talking about epicurus uh also uh, his his first school of happiness which he started in rome and then we started looking at uh, uh, marcus aurelius uh, his stoic philosophy and how he has come up with the idea of meditation and then we started looking at economics uh, so professor laird from london school of economics john halliwell ratvin hoven uh, and it all started with isterlin and then even uh, you know professor amartya sen had joined the this whole fray and he started talking about the the happiness so you know uh, there are clues available in all kind of subjects that we look at all kind of stream of thoughts that we can look at and then what we have done is that we have actually gathered all this research from different 
uh, field of knowledge and then combine them together to convert them into a course called science of well-being or happiness, uh, science of happiness. So that's what exactly we are doing. So what I'm going to talk about is all purely based on research. And what does the research say about happiness, about human being, and what lesson we can learn from that, and what kind of actions that we can design uh, based on these lessons. So let me begin with, uh, because of the paucity of time, let me begin with uh, a small video of uh, about five, six minutes uh, for, for from my campus. It, this will give you a fair idea about what exactly uh, we do in our campus to ensure happiness for the students, faculty, everybody. So let me just play that video for all of you. Just give me. Wait, is it uh, all right? Yes, sir, it's audible and Not only just management education, but a true happiness culture is what Jaipuria Institute of Management Jaipur delivers. The institute, which over the years has been credited with continuously evolving to provide excellent management education. Over the years, the approach not only to academics but also to student holistic development has changed. Let's hear what the director of the institute, Dr. Prabhat Pankaj, has to say about why teaching happiness is important. Teaching happiness is an important milestone for Jaipuria Institute of Management. The first question we confronted was, why should we teach happiness? It is important to have a positive evaluation of life. As we know that more than 50,000 thoughts uh, struck us every day. Uh, and out of that, 80% of these, these are negative. So we are actually, our mind is actually tuned to negative thoughts. Uh, after teaching happiness in our campus, we found that the students uh, who have gone through the courses, they're more energetic they are more enthusiastic, they are more purpose oriented and they are able to find their goals better. The campus uses a lot of happiness nudges in this process of cultivating happiness on the campus. Students find themselves involved in many actions, fulfilling their state of mind for overall betterment. The institute also focuses upon happiness mandalas as a framework that it follows for happiness on the campus. Aesthetic, intellectual, and ethical in all processes. Uh, happiness has to be holistic in nature and it depends on the learner's acceptability. So we have oriented our campus on happiness model which has got four cores. We call it uh, happiness mandalas. Uh, and the outer mandala you can see is the green mandala which enables the learner to accept the fact that this institution belongs to them and they are able to learn here. Students, through these instruments like Jaipuriya Code of Conduct or Five Habits, where our people are thinking that cheerful disposition, which means be happy, be grateful, be enthusiastic, are the part of our core. Let's now hear what the Dean of Student Affairs, Dr. Danishwar Sharma, has to say about the campus and its activities directed towards cultivating happiness and well-being on the campus. Happiness, they say, is not only a destination, but a journey. And this journey continues not only inside the classroom, but also outside the classroom. Through various activities, quizzes, competitions, we continue to discuss this wonderful concept of happiness. The institution is also working with Yogesh Kochar, World Happiness Ambassador at the House of Lords and founder of the Your One Life app. With his expertise in the fields of mind management and happiness, the campus is adapting towards a more enhanced culture of happiness. Let's now see how the institute has made efforts to design a well-being room on the campus premises where students and faculty meet for informal conversations, meditation, fireside chats, and to discuss topics related to well-being and mental health. science-based 
approach to well-being. And when I say science-based, I mean it in the broad sense of the term. Part one of the course talks about diagnosing your level of well-being through various questionnaires, psychometric instruments, observation from others, and so on and so forth. So that is part one of the course. In part two of the course, they try to enhance their well-being through different kinds of approaches. Hi, I am Priyal Mathur. I am enrolled in the course of Science of Well-being, and I am learning all the dimensions of well-being and happiness for my personal growth as well as for my surroundings. The institute provides education not only to its own students but has also been actively teaching and spreading happiness to the underprivileged sections of the society. The institute, under the aegis of its Social Responsibility Committee and Center for Sustainability and Happiness, has successfully conducted many flagship programs for the welfare of weaker sections of society. Let's hear from Dr. Varun Chotia, Chairperson, Social Responsibility Committee and Center for Sustainability and Happiness. In this respect, we have certain flagship programs, be it Mindbloom, where we have adopted a government school nearby the campus, Urja, where we are teaching uh, the Basti kids nearby our campus, we have the WISH program wherein our students are working with NGOs across the academic year. It's a credit program. And we also have Sarthi wherein uh, we have adopted certain villages in Jaipur wherein we are working for the development of those villages. Primarily, we are targeting three sustainable development goals. That is Sustainable Development Goal 1, No Poverty, Sustainable Development Goal 4, Quality Education and Sustainable Development Goal 12, Responsible Production and the Consumption. The has been long associated with the education of Bhutan and its people. It has been a privilege for the Institute to host the delegates from this happy nation on various occasions. There has been quite an exchange of knowledge and research between the Royal School of Management, Bhutan, Royal Timpu College and Jaipuria Jaipur. The campus has also played an important part in consultancy projects for the government of Bhutan, and this relationship between the two is getting better by each day. The Institute with its work on happiness has been continuously praised for its advances towards society and its students receiving many national awards such as QS India Rankings, Institution of Happiness Award, and the National Unicorn of Happiness award by the All India Council for Technical Education. Happiness is a greater good and Jaipuria is committed to making it available to everyone. Namaste. Uh, let me now go back to my PPT and start talking about happiness. Uh, is PPT visible, uh, Professor Mohit? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, all right. Uh, so, uh, Professor Moit has already pointed out uh, Yale's most popular course is happiness. You know, everybody needs this in large quantity, large measure. And there are two legs on which our life moves. One is health and other is happiness. If these two are not available, uh, nothing is material for us. Whatever we do, uh, we fail in our pursuit. If we don't feel healthy, if you are not healthy, and if you are not happy, uh, there are select perspective on happiness. So I would like to go with that. One is uh, by Amartya. He talked about uh, capability approach to happiness. So he said that if you look at two individuals with a similar kind of you know uh, setting uh, achievements, uh, one will be uh, more happy than the other. So what explains the difference between uh, the higher happiness of one person in comparison to other, irrespective of what they have actually earned uh, in their life? So he says that is capability to happy. So if there is something called capability to be happy, then it also gives us the clues that this capability can be enhanced. And there are many peer reviewed journals, uh, publications, which have supported this idea by saying that if you actually organize two to three weeks of interventions uh, on happiness, uh, the participants happiness have actually tended to increase by about 25%. So that's what, uh, you know, the outcome of happiness intervention says. This means that there is need to work on happiness and we need to look at how happiness can be enhanced in the life of our students and in the life of our, our faculty members. Uh, there's another approach uh, by Martin Seligman, the most celebrated uh, psychologist. Uh, he differentiated between pleasant life, a good life, and a meaningful life. He said that pleasant life is not exactly the happy life. So if you are hankering after a pleasant life, uh, it may elude you at some point of time. So you have to look at what good life is all about and what a meaningful life is all about. So the moment we understand the difference between pleasant life, good life, and meaningful life, 
uh, you know, most of our worries in the life will go. And then we will be able to plan our life in such a way that it actually creates more happiness for us. So we, we are going to throw a lot of light on this aspect. Uh, this very interesting work that has been done by Dan Butner. Uh, he actually talked to people uh, all across the globe who lived more than 100 years. So, you know, looked at the longevity of these people and they were very happy people who lived more than 100 years. And he actually, uh, you know, explored their lifestyle and everything. And then he came up with a few lessons for all of us. He said that these people who lived more than 100 years, they actually walk naturally. So they are, uh, they, they prefer walking a lot. Uh, and, and in our life, sedentary life, you see that, you know, the walking has actually gone. Rather, we are sitting on the chair for a very, very long time. And it's a source of unhappiness because the new data uh, from the science says that, the medical science says that if you're sitting in a chair for more than two hours, it is going to harm your body as much as a cigarette can harm. So it's a long sitting is a new form of smoking. Uh, and, and this is very much, you know, uh, corroborated with a study by uh, Don Bittner for these people who have lived more. Uh, uh, and these people know their purpose. So, you know, when we get up in the morning and if our days are sorted out, we know that what exactly are lying ahead in the day and we want to meet this person, we have to do this, we have to carry on this task, I'm going to do this, this, this. And if these are largely sorted out, you will feel that the day's day will be pretty happy for you and you won't get that much of a stress. But if you get in the morning and you're not sure about what to do in the day, then, you know, your mind is going to be clustered and you're going to be, you know, less happy because you are going to get a lot of stress to find out what to do for the whole day. So that's knowing the purpose is so important. Uh, but people actually uh, do not, uh, you know, nobody can guarantee that you have, you're now going to have stress. Everybody has their own share of stress. But people, those who are happy, they know how to shed their stress. Uh, eat less means, uh, you know, uh, these people actually uh, do not overeat. Uh, eating less means that, that, you know, when your stomach is 80% uh, full, we stop eating uh, because, you know, you, we don't have to give too much uh, of food inside because the, na the natural science, the nature, nature-based medicines, uh, you know, and medical treatment also suggests that, uh, you know, food is the source of toxin in our body and, uh, and it is the source of most of the disease that we get. And we can live disease-free if we start regulating our food and start eating less. Uh, there are many things that, uh, you know, this book talks about, so I'm going to move forward. If there is any question, I can answer on that. Is there a science of happiness? You know, that is the question that I would like to answer first. So look at this experiment done by Richard Davidson in Wisconsin. Uh, he showed in MRI scan the happy baby face, and he found that the patch has appeared on one side of the brain. And longer the duration the baby was shown, uh, the patch actually increased, and it, has, it had gone up to 52 mm. So that is what his finding is. And when he showed the defaced baby uh, in the similar MRI scan, he found that the patch has appeared on the other side. So he concluded the fact that the happiness is, has a place in our brain where, the, where it gets recorded and it's a neurological phenomenon. So people started asking him, if happiness is a neurological phenomenon, then can we see happiness? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to show you today is never seen before. I'm going to show you happiness neurological phenomenon called happiness. So let's see, this is how happiness plays out in our brain. And this is happiness, actually. So what is this phenomenon? He says that, you know, the molecules of the protein myosin is dragging a ball of endorphin along an active filament into our inner part of the brain, which is called the parietal cortex, and which is producing the feelings of happiness. That's what uh, happiness is. So people also started asking that if it is a chemical phenomenon or if it is a neurological phenomenon. So what are the chemicals responsible for our happiness? And this is where the clue to life actually lies. If you look at all the chemicals which are responsible and their sources from where these chemicals actually come to our body uh, to give us a good feeling. Uh, I did this exercise with uh, my audience uh, across CEOs, top, top, uh, top, uh, top professionals from corporate world, down to the students and to the faculty. I asked them to list 10 things which they think uh, is going to bring them happiness. I suppose if I ask you to, to list 10 things uh, which you think is going to bring you happiness, if you get that or if you achieve that, you will be happy. So when people have listed uh, 10 things uh, which are important for them and their happiness, uh, I analyzed more than 5,000 uh, responses. And then I found that more than eight of these responses, like 80% of the responses, where people think that the life is all about or happiness is all about, were actually coming from dopamine. 
uh, and their sources are doping. For example, uh, people said that they want recognition, they want money, they want power, they want positions. These are all dopamine based. Because when you achieve a goal, uh, precisely because the you know, dopamine level increases in your body, and that's why you feel good about achieving a goal. Uh, you know, having a bath after taking bath, you feel good uh, because your dopamine level increases in your body. It's like eating ice cream. Dopamine is like eating ice cream. So you like ice cream, you eat ice cream. Uh, when you eat ice cream, you get pleasure out of it. You get happiness out of it. But this happiness is dopamine based. Uh, remember, uh, the problem with eating ice cream is that it doesn't stop at one ice cream. You need another ice cream. You need another ice cream. You need another ice cream. So every time it will recur. And that is the nature of dopamine. You're actually completely doped. And that's what is happening with the money. So if suppose money is source of happiness, then it doesn't end at one point. You need more money, you need more money. If promotion is the source of happiness, you get another promotion, you want another promotion. So what it does is that dopamine, that it puts you on a hedonic trade mill and you are actually running on the trade mill uh, and you are reaching nowhere. And that is why if you're planning your life and if you're identifying 10 factors which will make you happy and out of that, if eight are dopamine based, then your life is already messed up. And at the end of the day, uh, when you be 60, 70, uh, you start looking back your life and evaluate what happened to my life. Am I happy? And then you will find that a lot of people who have actually achieved a lot in their life in terms of big house, car, money, everything uh, is very, very disgruntled with life. People have committed suicide even after being a millionaire. We have seen that. So, you know, uh, this is why it is happening, because you are actually placing all your bet on dopamine. But look at oxytocin. Uh, when you are uh, when you are helping others, let's say, uh, you also feel good. But when you are helping, uh, you are actually uh, incurring cost. You are you are you are you are devoting time. Uh, you are you are uh, you are spending resources. Uh, but still, you want to help others. Why do you want to help others? Uh, that's the fundamental question. Because when you when you have a cost, and then still you want to help others. This means that you get that satisfaction from helping others. That's the reason why you want to do this. Your own self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment. But let's compare uh, the feeling that you get out of helping others and the feeling that you get out of eating ice cream. Are they the same? The ice cream is giving you pleasure, is happiness, where you feel good about it. Uh, that kind of feeling. And then when you help others, you also get pleasure, you get uh, satisfaction, you get happiness. It's the same feeling. No, they are not the same feeling. Remember, uh, ice cream is dopamine uh, and helping others is oxytocin. So if you plan your life 10 items uh, to achieve, and if you make it 50% dopamine based and 50% look at the oxytocin, look at the serotonin, such a magic uh, happens in your body, if you actually uh, uh, do mindfulness and start living in present, you understand how you control your mind, how you actually train your mind. Uh, you pick up exercise as one of your routine. You start laughing, smiling, right? Uh, and you choose it as a part of your demeanor. Uh, does it make difference? It makes a lot of difference in our life. So people who are happy, they know how to plan their life, how to actually choose uh, items uh, to pursue, which actually is based on oxytocin, uh, serotonin, and endorphin. So in nutshell, if you're talking about the science of happiness, we'll say uh, serotonin is happiness, dopamine is pleasure. And that is what Martin Seligman said. Uh, you know, pleasure, ple pleasurable life is one thing, uh, happy life is another thing. So, you know, we have to understand the difference between the two. Uh, failure of well-being. Uh, you look at what is happening in our country. 74% Indians suffering from stress, 88% anxiety. Who is there who, uh, you know, find out one person who is not having uh, uh, suffering from anxiety. And uh, the worst that is happening to us is uh, look at the young generation which comes to our institutions. They are all so stressful. They are so uh, you know, full of anxiety. Uh, and it's so important to talk to them about positive evaluation of life, uh, precisely because, you know, if they get depression or anxiety, too much of anxiety at this age, uh, the research says that, you know, their cognitive competency will go down when in the later age, like when they become 40s and 50s, when they will start working with the corporates uh, somewhere else uh, they, for their livelihood, their cognitive competency will go down. And you know, 12% of them have been found to lose job as well because of this phenomenon. Because, you know, what happens in 20s and 30s is going to reflect 
in your life when you become 40s and 50s and that is such such a scary uh, thing thing to uh, think about and therefore it's, it makes a strong case that you know we should talk about positive evaluation of life with our students especially uh, richard davidson also uh, raised this uh, fundamental question so why some people are more vulnerable to stress and negativity why others are not uh, he actually talked about distractibility and he talked about attention deficit <clears throat> so he asked this question to his audience uh, the first question he asked was uh, what are you doing right now if suppose you know, i'm asking you this question uh, what are you doing right now your answer will be that well you are you are joined the talk and you are listening to me on happiness that's what you are doing right now so he also uh, did that uh, and then he asked the second question to his audience the second question was very important i listened to this very carefully he asked where is your mind right now or at this moment so if i ask you you are here listening to me but where is your mind is your mind on the talk or your mind somewhere else uh, and look and behold uh, you know the david richardson's audience 62% of them accepted the fact that the mind is not here they are here but their mind is not here so a lot of research has come come up which says that the wandering mind is not a happy mind so if your mind is actually traveling in thousand directions you have very less opportunity to become happy uh, and therefore he correlated uh, the mind movement uh, their inability to live in the present and the happiness of the individual and he found that you know people whose minds are wandering uh, they are less happy so you know uh, mindfulness is so important and living in present is so important uh, this is one of the study i would like to uh, introduce it to you is by harvard uh, is uh, 70 years it took 70 years to conduct this uh, study is a longitudinal the large the longest longitudinal study available and three generation of resource persons have gone into it uh, i'm just uh, giving you two findings from this study one is uh, they looked at the childhood factor whether childhood factor does matter uh, uh, when we age uh, and the study concluded that childhood factors or childhood temperament or ancestral longevity uh, your uh, uh, love and affection that you got in childhood uh, uh, you know it didn't have much correlations with the physical your physical health your length of life your life satisfaction and your mental health when you actually grow up become adult uh, but this is actually uh, rolled in the mid age and that is that gives us a clue to uh, controlling the happiness because you know we all are responsible for our ha- happiness because the way you manage your mid life is the indicator of how you will be age uh, and then if you are a smoker if you are alcohol uh, into alcohol lot lot of alcohol alcohol or if you have picked up exercise as part of your routine or if you have a stable marriage the study says that uh, the exercise and stable marriage had a high positive relationship with mental health life satisfaction happiness etc while smoking and alcohol abuse uh, would actually undermine your happiness when you grow up uh, so aging is a problem uh, which we have actually created for ourselves we have not taken care of our life when we were in the mid age and that's why uh, we are facing lots of problem uh, physical and mental uh, when we age uh an interesting point that this study highlights is that the men who actually liked working the most at the age of 60 they are the one who liked their retirement the most at the age of 75 so it says emphasizes the fact that the work is so important uh how we approach our work makes a difference on the quality of our life so are we approaching our work because we have to work because there is a salary associated with it or we are approaching our work we really love to work or really want to work? so the people who have actually loved their work and they have actually try and find out the identity with the work itself and combine them together are the better happy and therefore uh, the question of whether uh, you know if somebody ask you to do more work you should be happy or you should be sad uh, the research at least says that you should be happy because as long as you are working uh, you know and, and working uh, very very closely uh, very passionately that's the indicator of how happy you will become i can talk about this uh, at length education and longevity uh, this study also found to be highly correlated and they found that the uh, people have lived longer who actually have the learnability uh, they learn more and they have inquisitiveness for learning new things uh, they have more longevity and the people who are more engaged the people who are more work oriented and they love uh, what they do uh, these are the kind of people whose longevity are more now there are three findings i would like to share with you uh, which has actually put the happiness as an important agenda in public policy uh, so far we have been talking about happiness at the personal level but many at many platform we have seen that happiness is now used 
as a public policy. So first uh, thing that the research says is that the wealth is not enough for happiness. So you know, a lot of studies have gone into saying that, uh, well, money is important for happiness, but not all that it is important, right? So you know, there are a lot of things that is beyond wealth, beyond money that you know, we need to take care. Second, it says the happiness is measurable and accessible. It goes against the, uh, the traditional belief that the happiness cannot be measured. But now uh, we have developed lots of tools, uh, the uh, lots of lots of facets uh, in which the happiness is measured. And the, even the time series data on happiness is available. So if you go to Ratveen Hovind's website, World Database of Happiness or the World Bank's Happiness Report, you have lots of data on happiness available. So people are now working a statistical work they're doing on happiness. Uh, and those who are interested in happiness studies can look into these websites and uh, pick up the data and, and do the statistical modeling and, and, uh, and start working on that. Third point, happiness can be promoted via public policy. And therefore, you know, what, what uh, the, the, the fundamental idea here is that the happiness is not a place to arrive. And there is nothing called like, you know, you have become happy now or you have actually reached a place uh, of happiness. There is nothing called destination. Happiness is not a destination. Happiness is kind of journey, is how you plan your life, how you lead your life is the indicator of happiness. Uh, I look at this statistical work, the classic statistical work which Sterling has done. So he took the three different waves of data from US, uh, 50, more than 50 years data. And he concluded that while the GDP of uh, the US has increased by about three, uh, three point or three, uh, three quotients, um, the average happiness has either remained stagnant or it has gone down. Uh, if you look at the preamble of the Constitution of the U.S., it talks about the pursuit of happiness. So after all these kind of study, people have started questioning what has happened to the pursuit of happiness. Where are we? Uh, uh, so you, we promise uh, promise happiness of the people, but you look at what has happened to the happiness of the people. Is the GDP that is growing, not the happiness? So that's the question that people have started asking. So this cross-cut country uh, comparison of happiness, if you see, then it clearly says that if you start plotting the uh, curve on it, you will get a U inverted U-shaped curve, which will have an upper turning point. Uh, and this upper turning point means that uh, there is a point uh, after which the in uh, income is not actually giving us happiness. Uh, and therefore, you know, classic uh, uh, speech made by uh, Robert Kennedy in 1968, uh, and he talked about, uh, th that was uh, in the University of Kansas, and he talked, he, it was in the run to the presidency. Uh, he talked about GDP and he said, I quote, measures, GDP measures, neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that what makes life worthwhile. You know, happiness actually depends on those factors which actually make life worthwhile. Uh, and that's what he also tried to point out. And therefore, you know, the clue to happiness is somewhere else. And that's why Tim Jackson, in his whole theorization, he talked about degrowth. And he also proved the fact that, well, the countries where the growth has actually slowed down for a considerable period are the one where the people are uh, were having better livability and they were better happy. So it's not about faster growth. It's about quality of life. You know, Joel Gardner's rise and fall of GDP is a classic work. Uh, we have a country nearby where you can see how things are happening is, is Bhutan uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, Bhutan is called the South Switzerland of South Asia. If you have not visited this country, I recommend that you must visit this country to see how happiness plays out in the whole country. The moment you enter this country, uh, right from the air to the water, to the people, uh, to the mountain, to the houses, everywhere you will see the traces of happiness. And you can realize why this country is called a uh, happy country. So it follows the concept called gross national happiness. Uh, Bhutan is almost like a second home for me because I lived there for seven years. And that was a wonderful time of my whole life. We have never, we will never forget those uh, days. Uh, if there are questions about Bhutan, I can answer that. But they have actually looked at nine dimensions of happiness. Uh, and then this is how the framework of GNH they use where they identify individuals as happy and not so happy. So, you know, if you have uh, more sufficiency on uh, the, uh, the dimensions uh, beyond the cutoff, uh, the people will be called, this person will be called happy. If they are not in sufficient dimensions, then they will be called unhappy. So this is a framework. So it's a, it's a long deliberation uh, of all these frameworks, so I'm not cutting short on that. Uh, ADB, very recently, uh, they have come up with something called Inclusive Growth uh, Index. 
And if you inclusive growth, uh, green growth index, uh, and then they actually correlated with happiness. And then you will find that in this graph, you can see, I uh, have taken it from the ADB report, uh, happiness actually and uh, IgGI are highly correlated. Uh, in fact, happiness actually lies beyond the IG. Therefore, uh, the institutions which actually adopted, has adopted the sustainability as the core principles uh, of operations or even the teaching module or practicing happiness, uh, pra practicing sustainability, are uh, will be having better chances to become happy. Uh, so this is uh, another clue. Uh, look at the country initiatives. So the entire OECD project is going on uh, on measuring the progress of society, which talks about uh, beyond GDP or other than GDP uh, as important factors of how we can measure progress. Uh, there are a lot you can learn from uh, Bhutan, Brazil, Thailand, UK, Australia, France, UAE. UAE is a country where there is a Minister of Happiness, there is a Ministry of Happiness. Uh, in World Government Summit in 2019, when I was invited there, uh, they were talking about the city of 2050. So in, city of, in 2050, what kind of city uh, are we going to live? So they talked about all the modern uh, you know, metaverse or AI based, uh, you know, conveniences. But at the same time, they also said it's not about the technology in 2050. Uh, technology will be all pervasive and it will be available to everybody equally, but it is about happiness. And therefore, the city of 2050 will be a city of happiness. It cannot be anything other than that. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the three Nobel laureate, uh, Amartya Sen and, and, and Jean Paul Fitossi uh, was commissioned by the French president. And they came up with a report uh, which is available on this website. You can see that report. And they talked about uh, how the progress of the society can be measured, uh, uh, which goes uh, beyond the GDP. So what is the need of the hour? So I'm just uh, coming to my last leg. Uh, need of the hour. So this is the uh, small piece that we have written in Times of India. So I'm going to give you uh, the crux of our research. This is particularly my research, uh, which talks about the four fulcrums of life. So the first fulcrum of life is body. Uh, and when it comes to body, uh, we have to adopt regular physical activities. Uh, do not sit at one place for a long time. And this is what we have to tell to our students or to our faculty, uh, get adequate sleep. So adequate sleep means you must sleep seven and a half hours. This is one thing that is not the pra being practiced by the youngsters. Uh, and we have to make sure that we, we teach them how uh, it is going to harm their body if they, they are not sleeping for seven and a half hours. Are they sleeping and getting up with the, with the dreams uh, see, see the dreams, the sequence of sleep is that it goes through different phases. And when you start seeing the dream, uh, that is the time when you get up. So, you know, people who get up after seeing the dream, that means you have completed the cycle. So it's very important that you complete the cycle of dream, uh, cycle of sleep. Uh, exercise, adopt exercise as part of your uh, daily routine. Start with 30 minutes, uh, simple exercise, that's the walking. So it doesn't take much. So all you have to do is to walk, uh, 30 minutes walk, Take it to 45 minutes or 60 minutes. Gut health is so important because, you know, uh, Pyle Kothari, the doctor, Dr. Pyle Kothari, she has written this book. I recommend uh, you to read this book. She talks about the fact that more than 70% serotonin actually gets generated in your gut. And the day your gut is not good, your mind is also not going to be good. So one of the things that actually hampers your happiness is inability to take care of your gut health. Uh, these are the small medical, uh, you know, uh, pursuits, but these are so critical for happiness. So this is about body. Now, another fulcrum of life is called mind. Uh, and uh, Marcus Aurelius, uh, this is the book I'm recommending to you, if you can read. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, the stoic uh, king of the, from the Rome, he said that there is one single thing that can ensure happiness is the healthy mind. Uh, and this is where we are lacking. We talk about physical health a lot. But no institutions actually give more credence to the medic mental health. And it's so important that we start talking about mental health. Um, and the facets uh, which can take care of your mental health is you have to pursue hobby, regular hobby. If you have not actually have left any hobby, a hobby uh, pursuing hobby is so important. If you have left it long back in your school time, you were playing cricket or you were a painter or you were a singer. A recommendation is that, you know, leave everything and pick up that habit once again, bring it back buy that guitar which you actually left in your school days uh, and start playing that. Uh, this is so critical for the, for, the, for the happiness of life. Active leisure is very important because, you know, uh, research says that the leisure is source of happiness, but it's the active leisure which is source of happiness, not the passive leisure. So if you keep sleeping on Sunday, do nothing, uh, at the end of the day, you become very, very lethargic and very unhappy. It's not going to bring you happiness. 
But Sunday, if you plan for doing uh, some socializing, some uh, cooking at home, some talking to your friend, uh, calling uh, or taking your family out, you know, if you plan your out, uh, plan out your uh, your your Sunday in such a way, uh, which actually engages you uh, in lots of other pursuits which are important for life, that's how you get the happiness. Learnability is very important for mind, uh, mind, healthy mind. The more you learn, the more you become aware. Uh, the better your mind thinks. Uh, that's that's so important. Uh, be a stoic. A stoic means, uh, you know, uh, the happy people are not those uh, who are not getting any problem or stress or or, or jolt, jolt in the life. Uh, these are not the people. Happy people are those who actually knows that the anxiety or problem of life are the part of life uh, and they will come. Uh, so they are ready for that. Uh, and that's why they are able to also face that. So they know that there are a lot of things that is not under our control uh, for change. Uh, and I don't have to worry about that. I cannot change the sun. I cannot change the moon because they are not part of my scheme. I cannot change my boss, not part of my scheme. So the students who are actually joining the job and would be very unhappy with the boss, uh, we have to teach them how to become stoic because the things which are not under your control to change is the one which is going to bring you unhappiness. But the things which are under your control, which you can easily change, are the things which you can, uh, which can bring a lot of happiness. For example, uh, you can get up in the morning at five. It's in your hand. No, no approval is required. No resources required, uh, right? Uh, and your one single decision of getting up at five can change your life. Look at Robin Sharma. He has written Five AM Club, uh, and he talked about the people who actually decided to get up uh, at five AM, uh, and then they, how they have changed their life because they started getting up uh, an hour or two hours early than what they used to get up. Uh, mindfulness is very important. Mindfulness practices are very important. So you have to adopt some kind of you know, mindfulness exercise. Uh, what we do here is the, the heartful meditation. The heartful meditation, the mindful meditations are so, so important to control your mind. I can talk about mind uh, later if there are questions. Third fulcrum of life is uh, heart. Heart means, you know, we are talking about the emotions. Uh, your, how you control your emotions are the indicator of your happiness, how you will live a good life. Uh, here I'm recommending the art of happiness by Dalai Lama. So because I'm running short, because I need to get some questions as well, so I'm just running fast. Uh, the fourth fulcrum is called the soul. Uh, the soul is about, you know, one's reason for being. That means you have to address the question who you are as a person. And then if you have found the purpose, which is larger purpose, larger than your pursuits, uh, helping others or things like that. What do you stand for? What is that you have actually? Why are you walking on this earth? What is the purpose behind you being here? Uh, and the Ikigai actually talks about this, the Japanese way of uh, long life. Uh, and it says that the, if you are able to connect the dot between passion, vocation, profession, and your mission, then you have actually achieved quite a lot. So nurturing the soul is very important, right? Uh, in Jaipuria, let, let me just finish in a few slides. In Jaipuria, uh, well-being is a part of our vision. Uh, like it says that the, we are in the pursuit of promoting human well-being. Uh, and, and it's a mission-driven activity uh, where we are focusing on the learner-centric education. Uh, we are putting the, the, the focus uh, uh, is on the putting the learner's interest first and then developing the learners. When we are developing the learners, we are also uh, talking about competent learner, ethically aware and socially conscious learner. Uh, which who, who is going to carry a positive and happy attitude towards life. So that's how uh, it, it becomes a mission driven, uh, of course, the continuous improvement. So these are the elements. So, you know, pursuit of happiness uh, or positive education is part of our mission driven activity. That's what I wanted to say. And then we are, we are considering well-being as a holistic construct, which actually does not only talk about the physical, but it also talks about mental, spiritual and social. So all this combined together is a holistic education. Uh, we're using a lot of nudges, uh, as you, you must have seen in the video as well. Uh, the, the primary nudges we are using is called, number one is the knowledge, that is awareness, where we have the blogs, uh, talking, fireside chat, engagement, that is, you know, building relationship. We, we tell our students, we teach our students how to build relationship uh, and why it is important to go beyond uh, the networking. Uh, we have the WISH program, we have the Project Goodwill, uh, and then we thought uh, we, we focus on the attitude that is thought uh, of mind. The thoughts are very important. Uh, and here, the students are able to find out the meaning, values, um, and the value of being sto stoic. Uh, and the fourth one is the habit. 
it, it all depends on uh, what practice and the choices that uh, we choose for ourselves because what we become is what the practices that we actually pick up we are a product of our practice so anything that we practice day in day out we become that uh, and it's very important that you make a conscious choice so programs like life after six five habits uh, active leisure these are things that we use over there uh, and we have this uh, instrument called Zepuria's five habits which talks about the cheerful disposition as the first thing, integrity, punctuality, dress well, work hard. And so these are all well-defined principles that we are using in our campus. Uh, we are cultivating the culture of happiness. It's not just about teaching. It's also about creating a culture of happiness. So there are four uh, you know, elements that we are using. It. Uh, we call it four mandalas. It's called the green mandala, aesthetic, intellectual, and ethical. So in the long run, the happiness actually depends on the principles and the ethics that you follow in your life. Uh, and that's integrity is so important for happiness. Uh, teaching and practicing happiness. So we have a three credit course on science of well-being, which we offer it to our students. Uh, and the well-being corner where the, the heartful meditations are being practiced, uh, including the fireside chats, etc. cetera. Uh, and then it's all about you know, balancing the rational aspect of brain, the left the left brain and the emotional aspect of it, the right brain, uh, that means the mindful and the heartful. Uh, these two have to be you know, combined together. Your ambitions have to be combined with your health. Your conscience has to be combined with your profession. Your dilemmas have to be combined with your wallet or assets. Uh, your inhibitions, challenges, commitments have to be combined with your friends, travel, entertainment, you know, something like that. So, you know, these two, balancing the two sides of the brain is so important. And that's what uh, you know we do here. Uh, we we do uh, at the level of practice, advocacy and research. We have a center for sustainability and happiness, which keeps on doing a lot of research. Um, and then we are part of the United Nations, uh, uh, you know, uh, principles for responsible management education. That's what we do. Our faculty they publish a lot of uh, PRG journals. And this is my blog, Learning Corridor. If you can take a snapshot of it and you can join, you can read a lot many articles. Uh, that we keep on writing. And this is my email, this is my number. So um, I'm sorry for exceeding your time. Uh, uh, if you have some time for questions, uh, over to you, boys. So if any one of you is having any query or question regarding the session, they can post it in the chat box. Meanwhile, I have my own questions for sir. Uh, so, sir, uh, I have, uh, when you started that video, uh, in between of that, there was a statement that our mind is trained to catch negative thoughts. So, sir, how can we detrain it if we are trained for that? Yeah, a good question. Um, so, what happens is that uh, the neuroscience says that we uh, in 24 hours, uh, adult brain will have 50,000 thoughts. And the, out of these 50,000, 40,000 will be negative thoughts that will come to your brain and 10,000 will be positive. That means 80% of what you think is negative. So, if you do not do anything about it, uh, then your mind is naturally uh, inclined to pick up a negative thought. It's called the cognitive bias of mind. The so mind actually suffers from cognitive bias. Then it also says that the mind is neuroplastic. So neuroplastic means the mind is actually wired for picking up negative thoughts, of course, but this wiring can be changed. So, you know, how do you change the wiring of the mind? So you change the wiring of the mind through practices, and these practices are mindful practices. These practices are, you know, different kind of nudges that we use in the campus. So um, I say, uh, you know, uh, important discussion. Uh, uh, it, it will take some more time to talk about it, how we do it. But through nudges and through, you know, uh, practices, mindful and heartful practices. That's how we can rewire our brain. Um, sir, what do you say about people who have associated their happiness with the destructive activities? Like um, is like they get happy when things are going wrong all around, and like yeah, for example, so, uh, it is. I I know that. Uh, so you know, uh, you get happy. You think that the happiness lies in money. The happiness lies in eating ice cream. I, happiness lies in killing others. Um, right. So that's how your brain is uh, telling you. So these are all dopamine effect. So you are already doped. But what happens to the life? Uh, we have also have lots of examples where people have actually done these all these kind of thing. But at some point of time, when you start looking back your life and start evaluating, have I been really happy? Uh, you will realize that many people have admitted the fact that, well, no, we are not happy, right? 
uh, we are not happy because something is missing. So, you know, uh, let these people do what they're doing. I'm not suggesting anything to them. But question here is that uh, these are not uh, the happiness in evaluative sense of the term. This may be happiness or whatever you call it, pleasure, in the affective sense of the term. So affective sense of the term and evaluative sense of the term are two different things. So your lifetime satisfaction depends on evaluative happiness. It's not on affective happiness. Say, for example, I'm drinking coffee and the coffee spill on me. So I'll be very happy. If I put off the AC, I'll be very happy. So these are not happiness. These are actually affective sense, happiness in the affective sense. So people actually confuse between what we are talking about. Are we talking about lifetime pursuit? Or are we talking about, uh, you know, small affective happiness? So these two are two different things. Okay, sir. So, uh, can we say that spirituality, the concept of spirituality is the core of happiness? What do you say about it? Yes, of course. Uh, spirituality is very important. Uh, I'm not talking about a religiosity. Uh, I have not done any in-depth study on that, so I don't want to talk about religious. What I'm talking about is spirituality. Spirituality is a very scientific thing because when you do mindful uh, exercises, uh, it actually focuses uh, or enables your mind to focus on present. And our inability to live in present is the indicator of how uh, the quality of life is going to be determined. So we either live in past or we live in future, right? We never live in present. Uh, and it's very important that we focus on present because, you know, uh, when are we talking about past? We're talking about past in the present. And, and bygone is already bygone. We, you have to be a stoic, right? Uh, and then when are you talking about the future? You're talking about future in the present. So, you know, present actions are the indicator of how you're going to live in the future and therefore where should be the focus if you really concern about the future you should focus more on what you are going to do today and that's how the life is made up of so spirituality helps you in that so it's very very important so the concept of prana or a life force that we say that they are different uh, in different places people use different term terminologies for the life force and prana is it related to happiness prana and life are I'm sorry, I won't be able to comment more on that, but uh, I'm not uh, a kind of, uh, I'm a very scientific flair, person with a scientific flair. So I've actually gone to investigate more into the literature, which is available from my, my science of mind, uh, neurology, uh, economics, sociology, history. So I have combined them together. So I'm not a kind of uh, uh, spiritual person uh, who understands spirituality in the depth of it. Right. I think you will be a better person to answer this question than me. Uh, but I guess uh, as you are explaining, uh, this must be very important. So uh, what are your views with the teaching of Vedas? Are they related to happiness? No comment. Okay. Uh, not yet explored. So I cannot comment on that. Okay. Uh, there, there was a request for you to elaborate the heartfulness concept. Yeah, that I can do. So heartfulness is uh, you sit quietly. Uh, this part of so we have taken this heartfulness from uh, Daji Maharaj, Daji Daji, Daji, uh, Daji Maharaj, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, uh, his his whole um, place called Nandan or Kanan Ban or something like that. So I visited him. I met him. Uh, I really liked his heartfulness. So what he says is uh, as follows. Uh, he says, sit quietly. You don't need any uh, guidance to do the meditation. Just uh, close your eyes uh, and focus on your inner energy. Uh, and then let all the thoughts come to your mind. Um, do not fight with the negative thoughts uh, if, if it comes to your mind. Do not fight with them. All you have to do is to ignore them. So you keep ignoring your negative thoughts. Uh, something like, you know, I don't, I don't want to entertain you. And if there is some positive thoughts comes, you entertain that positive thought. So all you have to do is to do this. Let all thoughts come to your mind and keep on ignoring the negative. Keep on entertaining the positive. And if you start doing this, uh, your heart and mind is going to be in balance and you will be very, very uh, tuned to the positive thoughts. So, I mean, even the quantum science, uh, I started looking at the quantum physics. So quantum physics talks about the vibration because it says that we are all energy. We are nothing but energy, right? So if our energy is zero, we are dead. So, you know, it, it, everything is energy. And where from this energy comes, he said that the words that we speak actually creates energy. And therefore, it's very, very important to choose the word that we actually speak. Say, for example, uh, if you say flowers, flowers, flowers all the time and colorful, what images that comes to your mind? 
it, uh, the fragrance, the colorful manifestation, all, all this will come to your mind. But if you start saying, shit, shit, bullshit, what, will, what kind of image will come to your mind? And uh, I, mean, I mean, we don't understand that these things are going to harm your body and mind, but they do actually. And therefore, it's very important that what kind of words we choose to speak is so, so very important. And, and we need to tell it to our students. So is happiness related to law of attraction somewhere? Law of attraction? Uh, I mean, there is something called, uh, you know, I, I know about the law of universe. Uh, I don't know how law of attraction will be at, uh, associated with happiness or not. But law of universe, I know. Law of universe says that, you know, uh, we become what we practice and we get what we become. Uh, we never get anything what we are not. So if you really want to get something in, your, in, in life, you have to be that, right? So, you know, uh, uh, whole focus should be to become something that you really want to be. So that's the, that's the law of universe. Uh, law of attraction, I don't know much about. I can't relate it with happiness. So what is your say about the practices of writing happiness journals and positive affirmations? Are yeah. they impactful? Yeah, they are very important, impactful. It's very important that we keep on researching our happiness because, you know, the more you research, the more dimensions will come in front of you and you will be able to experiment more, innovate. So, you know, writing is very important. And, and, and the journal writings are good. And there is a journal of happiness as well. So, Radveen Hovan is the editor of that. Thank you, sir. I guess all questions have been answered by you. And uh, so, uh, before ending the session, I would extend my thanks to the our, to our speaker, Dr. Prabhat Pankaji. Yeah, for somebody has written headquarter is Kanha Santi Vanam. Yeah, you're right. Heartfulness Center is Kanha Santi Vanam. So now I would like to extend my thanks to sir, Dr. Prabhat Pankaj for enlightening us over such an important and valuable topic of happiness that is very lessly talked all around, but is very important in current stage of where people are suffering from stress and anxiety that we should talk about it in a more vocal way and reach out to people who are suffering and not knowing it. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. I would extend my gratitude to Dr. Ramaswamy Nand Gopal, President Ames, for allowing us to share the stage. I would extend my thanks to Mr. Sudhir Sharma, Regional Vice President Ames, Northern Region and Chairman Master School of Management Merit for facilitating this session and considering happiness as an important topic to be discussed. I would extend my thanks to the Ames Secretariat. And I will extend my thanks to all the participants here on Zoom as well as on the YouTube for being such a kind audience. Thank you very much. I would like to end this session. If you allow me, uh, I would like to uh, you know, express my gratitude for Ames, uh, Sudhirji and the president who have given me this opportunity and to you uh, for conducting this so well. Um, and I would like to apologize to all the participants who have put in lots of questions and they wanted to ask. I was not able to answer the paucity of time, but I'll, I can ensure that if you can write to me uh, on my email or on my WhatsApp, uh, I can 100% get back to you with the possible explanation I have. Thank you, Thank so you much. very much, sir. Thank you very much for your words.